Well, over the last uh, two Sundays, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 2 and digesting it piece by piece. And uh, like a puzzle, tonight we're going to put that final piece together in this chapter. So if you do have your Bibles and would like to follow along, I'm going to be reading Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, which acts as sort of a, a centerpiece to this after Christmas um, story of Jesus' birth, this period of time that takes place right after the birth of our Savior, with the coming of the wise men and with the flight of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph down into Egypt. I'm going to read verses 13 through 15 of Matthew chapter 2. Now when they, that is the wise men, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain, remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, on this important holy night, we look to your word for an understanding of your nature, for to, uh, to recall the, uh, the Christmas narrative, to rejoice in your fulfillment of prophecy, to grow in the Lord, and to be encouraged by that word for our life today. So we pray that you would encourage us through the hope of Scripture, and may we rejoice in new ways this Christmas for having been called out of Egypt like Jesus himself was. In his name we pray, amen. Well, everywhere in our life of faith, Jesus has already been there. Everywhere you go, Jesus has already blazed the trail. Do you realize that? In fact, he is with us now. But wherever we have gone in this world, in our life of faith, Jesus has already walked that road. Do you remember the timeless Christmas special, A Charlie Brown Christmas? I do, and I remember it well. Charlie Brown is the director of the Christmas play, and he approaches Frida and Pigpen. Now, you know who Frida is. She's the girl with the naturally curly hair. You know who Pigpen is. He's the kid who always has a cloud of dust surrounding him. He is that one who apparently doesn't wash and is, uh, in fact, embodies the name Pigpen. Well, as uh, Charlie Brown uh, is directing this play, he approaches Frida and Pigpen about going over their lines. And of course, as you know, Pigpen is surrounded by a cloud of dust, and this exasperates Frida, who's afraid that Pigpen's dirt will destroy her naturally curly hair. And Frida says this, I can't go on, there's too much dust, it's taking the curl out of my naturally curly hair. Charlie Brown responds with these words of wisdom. He says to Frida, don't think of it as dust. Think of it as maybe the soil of some great past civilization. Maybe the soil of ancient Babylon. It staggers the imagination. Pigpen may be carrying soil that was trod upon by Solomon or even Nebuchadnezzar. Well, the Word of God carries the spiritual soil that was trod upon by the Old Testament saints, by Moses, and in fact, by Jesus Christ. Jesus, even in his infancy, blazed a trail, a trail of prophecy and sacrifice that we follow too if we would just believe in him and follow him in faith. Now in our text this evening, Matthew points out yet another prophecy that Jesus fulfilled in his birth, the prophecy of being called out of Egypt. 
in verse 15. And it starts with Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fleeing to Egypt, verses 13 and 14, and then ends with the three of them returning from Egypt. Now, the striking thing about this is that it essentially reenacts the migration to Egypt by Jacob and his family, and then, following that, the great exodus 400 years later out of Egypt, 1,400 years before Christ. And this shows us, as a fulfillment of prophecy, that Jesus, in a sense, is walking the same road traveled by his ancestors and shows him blazing a trail that we ourselves follow in salvation. Now let me explain. Look at two dimensions of this being called out of Egypt. The first thing I think we see in verse 13 is the call of God's Son. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being called. Now, the wise men left uh, another way. We see this in verse 13. And when they, the wise men, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Now, the wise men had visit, visited Jesus in the home, and they worshipped him. They offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the wise men, who were originally going to go back to Herod and, and basically report on where Jesus was, an angel in a dream says to them, don't go back to Herod. Go back, go back to your place in another way. So they left in another, or be another route without telling Herod where Jesus was. And an angel then anticipates, uh, in anticipation of Herod's violent tirade, that Herod is about to kill these children in Bethlehem, this angel in this dream instructs Joseph to get up and flee to Egypt. Now this is uh, interesting, and I believe God had a purpose for this, and I believe that God was doing something amazing through Joseph in the New Testament as a recollection of the Joseph in the Old Testament. Think about the striking similarities between the Joseph in the New Testament, the stepfather of Jesus, and the Joseph in the Old Testament, the one who brought his family down into Egypt to save them alive. Genesis 50, verse 20. See, Joseph of the Old Testament, is the, the first son of Rachel, who's pictured here in verse 18, weeping for her children. There's a connection, I think, between the, the a similarity between that Joseph and this Joseph in these verses in Matthew chapter 2. Look at some of the similarities. First of all, these two Josephs obviously have the same name. But secondly, they both receive revelation from God by way of dreams. They're both dreamers. Joseph in the Old Testament interpreted dreams. Joseph in the New Testament received dreams. Third, they're both sons of Jacob. Joseph in the Old Testament, his father was Jacob, whose late name was later changed to Israel. But if you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 16, we see that Joseph in the New Testament, his father is also named Jacob. But fourth, they both bring their family down to Egypt to save their family's lives. Now, Joseph in the Old Testament brought a large family down to Egypt to escape famine. Joseph in the New Testament brings his, uh, his little family down to Egypt to escape Herod's sword. So, of course, verse 14, Joseph gets up in the middle of the night and takes the child and his mother Mary, and they depart to Egypt. Now, this is sort of a mirror image of the first Passover 
in the Exodus, which was also done in haste. In the book of Exodus, we see that first Passover where the children of Israel escape Egypt in haste. Here, verse 14, we see Joseph taking his family and they escape to Egypt in haste. It's a mirror image. And it was done at night. And it was done in anticipation of the firstborn, in, at least in, uh, in Moses' day, of the firstborn in Egypt being slain. And here, a few verses later, we see other children being slain. Not necessarily firstborn, but children being destroyed. But the contrast here is that instead of fleeing out of Egypt like the children of Israel did so many years earlier in the days of Moses, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary flee into Egypt. And in this case, Egypt becomes their refuge. Now remember, it's only a temporary asylum because they will eventually be called out of Egypt. And there's a great deliverance awaiting them. And here, I think, is where the fulfillment of prophecy comes in. Look at verse 15 now. And, re and, and they remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, that prophecy that is written here in Matthew 2.15 is a prophecy that comes from the prophet Hosea. And it's Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And in that prophecy in, Hosea, in Hosea's day, in the 700s B.C., in other words, 700 years before Jesus was born, Hosea recalls a, a day when Israel was still in its infancy. Now, if you read a few verses down in Hosea chapter 11, you see that Hosea is actually giving them a harsh chastisement from the Lord because the northern king of Israel, um, they were, kingdom of Israel, they were trying to flee to Egypt to escape the terror of Assyria. Now, we can't go into the, all the history behind that. But that prophecy, out of Egypt have I called my son, Hosea 11.1, actually prefaces a prophecy against Israel for being unfaithful and trying to flee to Egypt when they should have stayed in Israel and trusted the Lord for their deliverance. But again, Hosea recalls a day when Israel was still in its infancy. When they were in Egypt and they were called out for the very first time. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So when the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt for, uh, 1,400 years before Jesus, and they cried out to God, God delivered them via the exodus under the leadership of Moses. But then in Hosea's day, several hundred years later, the Israelites had kind of grown up, as it were. And by this time, they were thoroughly idolatrous and wantonly disobedient. So God sends Assyria to carry them off in the form of a punishment. And rather than embrace that punishment in faith and trust the Lord who delivers, the Israelites of Hosea's day try to flee back into Egypt, the land of their slavery. Now think about Egypt for just a moment. Egypt carries a great deal of prophetic significance and, in fact, spiritual symbolism for the children of Israel because it's the place where they were enslaved. Now they had come down into Egypt to escape the famine, but over the next 400 years, as Pharaoh came and Pharaoh went and Pharaoh came and Pharaoh went, they were eventually brought into slavery. And by Moses' day, Egypt was known for its slavery, its sin, its death, and its darkness. 
In fact, you can see that when you look at the ninth and tenth plagues of Egypt. The ninth plague was a plague of darkness. And the tenth plague was the plague of the firstborn slain. That act where God destroyed the firstborn of all Egypt and allowed the Israelites to escape that slavery. But that ninth plague was a plague of darkness. We find this in Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. Such a palpable darkness that you could not even see your hand in front of your face, and that there was even a feeling of the darkness upon the children of Israel. But we're told in Exodus, in that same chapter, that there was light in the dwelling places of Israel. Now, when Israel went to Egypt while Joseph, uh, their forebear, was still alive, Egypt had been a place of refuge. But by Moses' day, it was that place of slavery and darkness. So Hosea reminds the Israelites that their sin had caused them to return to that place of darkness that may be felt. And if God called them out of Egypt, they should not be trying to go back to Egypt. But even so, if God can call them out of Egypt, can he not also do that a second time? So Jesus fulfills this prophecy in which the children of Israel, or like the children of Israel, he would be called out and carried out of Egypt, the land of slavery, sin, death, and darkness. Yet not for his own sake, because he's already free, he's already sinless, he, his is a life of light, and of course, light, life, so being called out of darkness, being called out of Egypt was not for his sake, it was for our sake. So we see a, a call of God's son to come out of Egypt, but knowing that this was not for his sake, but that it was for our sake, we also see this call out of Egypt as a call for God's people. Not only God's son, but also for God's people. Now this seems like a rather insignificant detail. Jesus being called out of Egypt. So what? We pass over it year after year after year. We focus on the shepherds and the wise men. And we have all the pageantry of all the shepherds and the wise men and the angels and the baby Jesus. Why this insignificant detail? detail because I think it has great gospel importance for us because it's a trail that Jesus blazed in our own deliverance in fact Jesus again even in his infancy acts as a hinge between an old exodus and a new exodus between an old people of God and a new people of God because what have we done? We have willingly fled to Egypt, the place of slavery, the place of sin, the place of death, the place of darkness. Where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves resorting to this place of Egypt with a darkness that can be felt. But because Jesus was called out of Egypt... And was able to live so that he can grow up to become a man. He can go to the cross, suffer the death, suffer the res or in enjoy the resurrection, so that we also can be called out of Egypt to be God's child as well. See, Peter reminds us of this reality in the often quoted verse. 1 Peter 2.9. Peter says this, But you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God, through Jesus Christ, has called us out of the Egypt of darkness and death of sin and slavery in order to live a new life as God's people. In fact, as God's child. And the light of the world shines on us even in our darkness. Isaiah 9-2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. But he shines that light on us even while we're in Egypt, but he does not keep us in that land. He brings us out into a new land, the land of salvation. So tonight, we praise the Lord who reveals this seemingly insignificant yet important detail in the life of the infant Savior, Jesus, carried by his earthly father, Joseph, who himself typified the Savior. Because Jesus was saved, he could grow up and become a greater Moses, leading us out of darkness of slavery the darkness of sin, the darkness of death, and live now in a new promised land of love and light. See, have you followed the Lord Jesus Christ out of Egypt? See, that's the question for Christmas Eve 2023. Have you followed the Lord Jesus Christ who called you out of Egypt just as he called his own son out of Egypt. You do so by hearing his call, by obeying that call, turning from your sin, and following your Savior. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Amen? Well, we're going to pray at this time. And after we pray over the next few minutes, we're going to sing that blessed Christmas carol, Silent Night. It's an opportunity for us to show the light that we have inside us, to show it outwardly by lighting our candles. Now, you should have a candle. And while we're, uh, uh, in just a few minutes, the, the ushers are going to come forward with lit candles. And they're going to start lighting the candles as they come down and here's what I'd like you to do. If you're at the end of an aisle and you have a lit candle, then take that candle and let your neighbor put his candle or her candle sideways to your candle. If your candle is lit, don't do this. We're having trouble with the fire alarm system. We don't want to get into further trouble. So keep your lit candle like this. The unlit candle goes like this. And then pass it down the aisle. And then as the, after the candles are lit, we're going to rise as we sing Silent Night. So let's pray together um, to close this time in God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for these seemingly insignificant details. Thank you that Jesus Christ reenacted step by step the exodus that you uh, called your people to, to, to walk. And as Jesus followed that pathway, he now leads us into uh, that greater pathway, that new exodus out of our own Egypt of death and darkness and sin and slavery. So, Father, thank you for calling us out. Thanking you for, thank you for giving us Jesus, the light of the world, and then calling us to be the light of the world. And I pray that we would do that for your honor and for glory in, the, in glory and in the joy of knowing that we, too, have been called out of Egypt. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.